our 2024 OLP series, Russian Online Language Pedagogy. My name's Sarah Booten. I will be serving as your facilitator for this series, and I think this is my sixth or seventh year doing this, and I can truly say it's one of the things I look forward to the most each year. And this year is a little bit of a different format than some of our traditional online language pedagogy series. Last year, we did a little bit of a change where we wanted to focus on less commonly taught languages and get into some panel discussions with some experts to really get into the heart of teaching a language online, especially a language as beautiful as Russian. I'm really excited to share all of this with you. So before we officially get started, I do have a few quick housekeeping things that I want to go over. Um, first and foremost, this is officially a, a series that's sponsored by the U.S. Department of Education. That being said, they are not endorsing or vetting anything presented. And of course, all opinions and thoughts shared by our panelists as well as ourselves are our own and nothing officially is being endorsed. I also want to take you out to our website that I'm going to go ahead and put in the chat for all of you. If you could please bookmark this, this might be a helpful resource as we're together over the uh, next couple of days or so. But I'll put the link to our website into the chat and I'll take you out there in just a moment. And hopefully you have had a chance to look through this, but we've got a lot of great resources here on our website specifically for this series. So it talks a little bit about uh, what the ideas are behind it and gives you the dates as well as uh, the time zones for those of us who are joining from all over the world as we often get folks from all over the world. So this will hopefully help with your planning. And we also have our panelists all shown here. We've got a really good group for you. And again, this is more of a panel discussion. Um, the chat is going to flow between the panelists fairly organically. So by all means, please feel free to put into the chat your own thoughts, feelings, feedback. If you have any questions, uh, we'll kind of address those kind of organically as they come in. Um, also, since the vast majority of the registrants are Russian teachers or they are able to at the very least speak Russian and understand it, there isn't going to be a lot of translation if the target language is used. However, if you feel that you need that help, please feel free to type that in the chat and we will do our best to assist you with that. Also, if you are interested, we are offering a digital badge with this series like we often do. Um, the criteria is outlined here, but basically we are looking for our registrants who want to earn the badge to attend all three of our live sessions. And we do ask that you are here at the start and stay till the end. Uh, also, also, we will be sharing our padlets. Um, these are some extra activities that we we'll would ask our participants who want to earn the badge to participate in, share your thoughts, and feel free to chime in on those posts from others. We'll have a reflection piece, we'll have an exit survey, and there'll also be an additional activity. The idea is that often we go to webinar series but passively listen. What I hope that we'll be able to do through doing these exercises is to create some type of a product that you might be able to use in your own online classroom into the next school year. So that is an option. Uh, we can't guarantee that the digital badge might earn CEU credit. So please check with your local licensing agency if you do need to earn a uh, CEU credits for an educational license. However, if you fulfill the digital badge criteria and your local agency approves, you could potentially earn this badge and use that for CEU credit. So we are very much looking forward to jumping in. Um, and once again, that is in the chat. Please feel free to bookmark this website as we'll have resources here for you. And so now I would like to have all of our panelists, if you could please introduce yourselves, uh, let us know a little bit about your background so that way all of our participants are able to listen in and, and have some ideas as to who you are. Uh, I don't have any particular orders. So uh, Evgeny, if we could please start with you. Of course, thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. My name is Evgeny Dengub. I'm a professor of Russian at University of Southern California. Well, I'm also director of the Center for Languages and Cultures. Um, I'm also uh, finishing up my uh, time here at Millbury School of Russian as an associate director and as a director of the Star Talk Teacher Training Institute. And um, yeah, I co-authored a couple of textbooks. You might be familiar with them, Etage and Panorama. I don't consider myself a big expert in online teaching, but uh, <laughs> I'll 
try to do my best in um, sharing my thoughts about, you know, language pedagogy in general. And because I think a lot of it applies to teaching online. Welcome, Evgeny. I can completely understand the feeling of not being expert, but we look forward to hearing from you. Uh, Larissa, if you could please share a little bit about yourself, please. Oh, okay. Um, I am a multilingual language learning specialist at the public schools in Washington State uh, with bilingual uh, world language, Russian and English endorsements. Um, I would say my area of expertise is a teaching heritage language speakers of all ages and all levels of proficiency. Um, and I also wanted to mention that teaching Russian language has always been my passion and profession. It is my homeland, <laughs> homeland language. Um, I was educated uh, in um, St. Petersburg, Leningrad, Russia, Elgo uh, Fak, Ruskizik Literatura. Uh, but for a long time, uh, it was a language that I literally used only at home um, when I moved to United States. And um, I discovered that if you use it only at home, uh, it does not guarantee its retention in children. And so it kind of prompted me to begin to build programs for children who spoke Russian at home. Um, in my quest for the programs and models, I found StarTalk programs. I've been involved with the start of programs for a long time now. Um, attended teacher's program in 2011. And then I taught some elective courses at the UW in Seattle. And I also uh, created my own program uh, through University of Washington called Blistatelny Sankt Peterburg. Um, that was the, during the COVID years. I had some time to um, teach online and practicing, uh, bringing online what I know works in a classroom. Um, yeah, it was, thank you for inviting me for this discussion. Thank you for joining us. And yes, I've noticed that those of us who are language educators, it quickly becomes a passion project and overtakes many aspects of our lives. So thank you for being here. Uh, Shannon, please go ahead. Hi, I'm Shannon Quinn. I am an associate professor at Michigan State University. Um, my education was at the University of Wisconsin, and my dissertation was actually on science fiction. So I still, from time to time, teach a science fiction course, which is really fun. But um, my career ended up going more in the direction of language teaching and technology. And the first time I taught online was, it was before we called it that, we called it interactive television. <laughs> um, and that was back in graduate school. Um, I've also taught at Middlebury uh, School of Russian. Um, I will be sharing some of my uh, projects, I think, as we go along. So I'll just wait on that. Thanks for inviting me. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Fantastic. And yes, definitely technology is a big part of teaching online. So we look forward to hearing more about that. Thank you, Shannon. And Olga, please go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Olga Klimova and I am uh, in the Slavic department uh, at the University of Pittsburgh where I'm the director of Russian program and where I teach uh, Russian language, culture, literature courses. I'm also the director of uh, StarTalk summer program for high school students and um, uh, StarTalk uh, program in the past few years was in the summer, but then we would have online uh, classes throughout the academic year. So we had a, an opportunity to work with high school students online. Um, also our elementary and uh, intermediate level Russian at the University of Pittsburgh are hybrid. So uh, that's where we also had a chance to adapt to different uh, strategies for online teaching. And uh, my background is in uh, Russian literature and culture. I got my PhD from the University of Pittsburgh. I also uh, got, uh, I've got a master's degree in uh, instructional technology from Duquesne University. And I worked as instructional technology specialist uh, uh, in Hampton uh, School District while I was uh, working on this degree. So I had uh, an opportunity to, to work a lot with the technology for language instructors. 
and uh, uh, um, I think that's it <laughs> for me. <laughs> I'm very excited about uh, sharing my experiences with the participants today. Wonderful, Olga, thank you. And thank you to all of our panelists for that introduction. It definitely helps us to frame a little bit about our panelists and the background and all the experiences and ideas you're bringing to the table. And again, thank you all very much for being here. Well, I do wanna dive right into it because I've got quite a few questions that I'm hoping we're going to be able to cover. And again, this is more of a conversation, so this might flow a little bit organically. And for our participants here, please feel free to type in the chat if you've got comments or things you might wanna add or questions. So please feel free to chime in that way. At the end, time permitting, uh, we might also be able to have participants come on, unmute your mic. And if you want to ask questions to our panel, please feel free to do so. so anyway, looking forward to jumping into this. And uh, Olga, since you, we're talking about your tech background, I wanted to start with you and we'll jump right into our first question. And that is, what aspects of Russian do you think are the most challenging to teach online? Okay, so in general, teaching Russian is challenging, can be challenging, whether it's in person or whether it's online. But I did uh, note a couple things that I personally find challenging in an online environment, it's of course, it's uh, trying to uh, keep students' attention, right? So trying to keep students' attention, especially if the class is long, if you're teaching online for like like our start of classes, for example, an hour and a half. So uh, what I've noticed that if it is, the materials are not motivating, are not exciting, if they're not related to real, uh, like to be culture, <laughs> to real uh, Russian language uh, content, it's uh, more difficult to to keep students motivated. As as for the specific topics, I would say that probably moving students from input to output this is challenging, especially because you have, I would I would say less control of the classroom, especially if it's virtual if it's online or if you're doing asynchronous a lot of asynchronous uh, tasks. So that's what we do in our. Uh, elementary intermediate um, classes at speed and uh, also probably writing writing and uh, handwriting is it has been challenging and I know that some of my colleagues uh, uh, in some programs have already uh, chosen not, not to teach handwriting because nowadays a lot of students are using mostly computers and uh, phones to to type to to text while I'm still kind of a little bit old school, so I believe that handwriting is is uh, helpful, especially in Russian speaking cul uh, cultures, because when students go abroad, they still end up filling out forms and you know, writing some notes or letters, explanations. So um, that's kind of challenging. So trying to find the ways how to uh, for students to practice handwriting, how to correct it, right? So you just I just needed to use special tools to make it work. So I would say these are my points. It's interesting that you bring up handwriting because I hear that from a lot of language teachers that that can be a big challenge, especially in the online environment. Thank you for that. And then let's go to, uh, uh, let's go to uh, Larissa, if that's okay. Let's go ahead and ask the same question. What aspects of Russian do you think are the most challenging to teach online? Oh, uh... Yes, I will agree that uh, the input uh, is uh, easier for us to, to do online. Um, output, uh, harder, uh, not impossible. And uh, the most difficult, I would say, aspect is uh, interpersonal communication. Um, interpersonal communication. So the communication not between the teacher and students, but actually between students to students. Um, there are different tools, but if it depends on uh, of your audience, right? I work mostly with um, school age children, right? Uh, high schoolers too. Um, so it needs to be some protocol of accountability for, for that too. Uh, so that's, I found uh, more challenging to plan. Again, not impossible, but challenging to plan. Um, with younger children, uh, we should always use the total physical response, which is kind of harder online as well. Um, but again, not impossible. Just have to plan for that. Um, and like the body response too. So it's it's harder to uh, to see online when you have like a talking talking head. 
Um, but there are some different strategies that we can use with that with younger children. Um, and also we, we know that the language is happening um, through using it. So aiming to this increasing the um, output of students they're speaking especially, I would say there's a many tools for the writing nowadays. Um, as speaking is the one that takes more uh, preparation. Uh, for writing, I use different programs for um, like interpersonal writing. For example, I use uh, the platform uh, called Formative. Uh, so Formative, um, there is a free version of it. There is some, you know, more uh, advanced there. Um, like silver version, a gold version, but um, everybody can use a free version for uh, instruction. So during the instruction, um, students can reply right away um, and have this accountability uh, of this output, uh, like in a real time. For example, you can show the picture and then you see uh, what they're writing. Uh, it can be done anonymously. So if uh, I'm projecting it to the screen, um, I don't want like students to be embarrassed of like their different, um, you know, spelling mistakes or something. Um, but I do know, like from my point of view, I know who is writing what. So this kind of the level of accountability. With speaking is, is harder, like I said. Um, and with this speaking, um, all this, you know, in a classroom, not in an online classroom, we use a turn and talk. Um, you cannot use it as uh, frequently as you can uh, use it um, in a person. Um, however, uh, there is such a function in Zooms as uh, rooms. Again, it's a paid subscription, right? You, or, or if you're working through the university uh, or some organization, you, you should be covered for this. But um, personally, you, you do have to. Uh, pay for that um, for the Zoom function as rooms. Um, again, you cannot do it every 10 minutes, um, but at least you know a couple of times during the class or one or two times you can do that, uh, allow students to go to rooms to discuss and to talk about uh, the uh, subject to, to use the sentences that they have to practice. Um, accountability piece here, uh, I found that uh, there is a function that you can go through these rooms and um, listen what students are talking about. You can even through the Zoom see if they are talking. So if you see there's nothing like um, no uh, sound bar means they're just silent. Um, and I would say that would be a struggle too. So I have to constantly like poke uh, and ask, okay, we have to actually talk. We're using the sentence frames. Um, let's discuss that. Um, what I found, another thing that can work with the um, higher proficiency, not with the novice, uh, maybe with novice need and look, so students who could already write the responses, is another accountability when they have to fill something out during their discussion. Um, but again, it's uh, a lot of planning, um, but I think it's worth it. Uh, I see the results of that, and also students are, have to practice and use their language right away from the first from the first lessons. Um, I would say um, other things since we're talking about different uh, different uh, materials that we can adapt. Um, I also use uh, easy things like uh, you know um, Google Docs, for example. Um, even without, you know, subscription to formative, you can use Google Docs and just create some documents together. Um, so students are talking and then they produce something. So they have this evidence that they talk about this and come up with, uh, um, with a written response after discussion. Um, another thing could be used is the uh, word wall. Uh, word wall when um, students are looking at things and they have to uh, listen and to discuss that too. Um, did I mention all of this? So there's some other tools. So just the bottom line is that um, I think the most difficult is to create this kind of environment for interpersonal communication. Uh, with the written tools, there are some tools, 
Um, but this interpersonal communication is very hard to um, uh, start this routine. The routine really helps too. Um, I, I see that the students who are older, not the high school students, um, they probably understand that um, the the meaning of this, you know, conversational practice. But with children, um, they're more um, maybe shyness, and they afraid to make a mistake, uh, and then they don't see the teachers with them in a room. And very most of the time, it starts with just silence, right? So they have to um, make sure they understand the meaning of it. Um, kind of set up, set them up for success. Um, and another thing that I would say too is, it's hard to in online environment to create kind of the I call it the word wall or the talking wall that you can uh, point uh, to see like okay here's a progression of skills. Um, I, I use the some boards in a, in a Zoom, you can actually use the a board, uh, interactive boards and just keep like adding information on during each class. And so this is like kind of, we can create it together during the lessons. Um, so there are many, many tools, but it doesn't mean it's easy to, um, to do. Uh, when I taught a very big class, uh, then I used another program, kind of very, it's difficult to set up, but um, I forgot what's the name of it. Mm. Oh, the Gather Town. I think with, uh, with the StarTalk people, we use that too. So um, this is when you can actually uh, choose your partner to talk. Uh, so it takes a lot of setting up, but once you set it up, then it's easier to um, have this kind of gamification of a conversation when you have to talk to different people and you don't have to be assigned by a teacher to a special room. Like you have to uh, use some um, sentences to ask and answer questions, even on an obvious level, right? You can ask like, uh, and so on. So it just makes it more more fun for especially um, younger kids and teenagers too as well to have this um, kind of interactive conversations. But it can also use with a, a advanced proficiencies as well. Um, you know, all this in a classroom, we can have inside and outside circles when sp people are speaking, but it could be um, done in this program when you have uh, two circles of people talking to each other one might have a text and another might have the picture and you have to uh, find this uh, match. So you have to talk to all the people, um, use particular phrases, sentence frames and um, finding your pair. So it takes um, a lot of talking to different people and movement online. Um, I think that's what's like the main thing that I wanted to mention here. Um, if anybody wants to say anything more about this, I'm I'm ready for a conversation. Thank you, Larissa. And yes, the interpersonal aspect of online communication can be quite challenging, especially if you have some reluctant learners that are a little shy. But I appreciate you sharing those tools and resources with us. Thank you for that. Uh, Shannon, asking you the same question. And once again, our question is, what aspects of Russian do you think are the most challenging to teach in an online environment? The thing that came to my mind, and I guess it's not unique to Russian, is that I think it's um, one of the most difficult things is creating a community in the classroom. And it's related to what uh, my colleagues were talking about before uh, with the difficulty of kind of informal communication. Uh, you know, it, in face-to-face -face classrooms, we're used to just having chit-chat before class or after class or sort of chit chat to the side um, that allows students to get to know each other and us to get to know them. And so I think that creating that community is something we have to, when we're teaching online, we have to be a little more 
um, deliberate about it, a little more intentional about trying to create that community. And so there are some different things that we can do. I think I'm just going to pick one to focus on right now. Um, and maybe our colleagues have other suggestions that they can put in the chat. But um, I think we often, we already do this in our classrooms, but I think uh, in an online classroom, we have to make even more of an effort to have our activities uh, built in so that they will need to listen, talk to each other, but also listen to each other. Um, so uh, when they report back, for example, if you have them go into breakout rooms and do something, oftentimes we have them report back after that uh, to the whole group. And um, it may be easiest to have them report back about themselves, but then that means that they may not be getting to know their uh, fellow classmates as well. And so I think making even more of an effort and being more intentional about having them always get to know each other uh, and have to maybe report back on their partner rather than themselves um, is a small thing that we can do, I think, to help to foster that community. I love the idea of asking students to report back things that they learned about their partner and getting some extra time in there to really share some thoughts and ideas. So thank you for that, Shannon. And definitely building a community is a really important part of teaching online. And that can definitely be challenging to do in the online environment. Thank you. And Evgeny, again, the same question, what aspects of Russian do you find that are most challenging to teach online? Uh, thank you. I think phonetics and intonation is very challenging, something that requires immediate feedback and individual feedback, something we are able to give in, you know, in real time, I mean, face to face. Uh, that's something that I've struggled a lot. Uh, I, and I think we should do more phonetics work, period. Um, regardless of the modality we're teaching, but uh, certainly do not lose this out of sight just because it's hard uh, harder uh, we still need to um, you know make sure this ik3 is uh, is there and the sounds are there so we I ended up ended up asking students to repeat what I said or work on the phonetics with the uh, turn of mics this is um, uh, I, I don't have time to ask in, in, individual students to to say a word a uh, word or a sentence but so they'll have to do it um, on on their own kind of thing uh, without me necessarily hearing them and that kind of brings me uh, to the point we are all making and especially Larissa you're making about the control accountability and I think online environment is is, is when we actually rethink our uh, you know, understanding of control and how much we can or should control um, our students. Yes, making them accountable, having them write something or say something, but uh, inevitably we it it's a much it's it's much less control environment if we want to make it effective. We lose something, we gain something. Breakout rooms and work with a partner in breakout rooms is by far the most meaningful and important part of uh, online lesson uh, lessons uh, according to my students. So they all say this was the most interesting, fun, uh, again meaningful part of the class. So I would challenge myself to do more than you know a couple of times uh per class i think you know going into breakout rooms can be clunky and can be going out of the um uh breakout breakout rooms can be sort of a time consuming but i think what we gain with this is so so precious so we i think we have to do it and um when I actually go to to breakout rooms, my students know that I will not I will not say Ozdrastvuti Kagdila, so they will just continue working uh, on the activities. So I'll just be the fly on the wall. Uh, so we, you know, the class develops this routine understanding that okay, we go to breakout breakout rooms, we go straight to work, and uh, we do that uh, interpersonal communication. And it's funny, some of us mentioned the um, uh, how community is is difficult to form and that's true at the same time 
shy students often report it's it's easier for them to talk uh, online when you know fewer people are hearing them in their breakout rooms. Uh, it's it's not like the whole class is watching and listening to them. So that's we got this opposite effect in a way, and I find it make it much easier to switch partners in my classroom i just it's hard for me to <laughs> constantly switch partners and pairs i know it's good for students but you know they get in this these they comfortable you know seats and they work with the same partners so uh, online allows us to constantly switch partners and develop the habit that okay there will be a new partner with each activity and i think that's great i just also want to i want a second formative i think formative is an excellent excellent tool i use it for quiz and um, I can see the results of the quizzes, like vocabulary quizzes that students do online. Um, and that's just, uh, there's a special color coding system when I can see red and green, and that's so convenient. And I can see items. For example, I got 10 items and one item, one word, you know, 80% students got wrong and I see red and like, okay, this is something I can work on right now, right here. And that's very very convenient so i think i find formative a very useful tool um but at the same time i'm thinking how can we use less technology in online classrooms so what i experience and i don't know my colleagues what what you think uh, and audience um please um say what you think so if if it's if it's tool after tool after tool there's so many great tools available but then it, at the end of the day, it becomes just, okay, so we need to log in, we need to make sure everyone is in the system, everybody's there, everybody knows how to use it. And it, um, I'm, I'm constantly um, telling myself to limit the use of online tools. There are certain ones that are essential, like Google Docs that was mentioned. Yes, but... Um, all others, you know, Kahoot, Formative, another Word Wall, they're all great. But um, um, I need to remind myself that, you know, um, everything is in moderation and it could be fatigue and um, certain sort of a um, time, loss of time uh, as we switch from, from tool to tool. And finally, I just want to uh, go back to the question of handwriting. I, I agree that handwriting is important. But, and sometimes our students, all, all five, you know, the whole five students who will end up going to Russia or Russian speaking country, they will end up filling out some form. But, you know, those forms need to be completed in block letters oftentimes anyway. And um, I don't, I don't know if we need to really um, push this and insist on uh, teaching them to handwrite. It's it's very useful tool, but again, we we get typing much much faster. Remember, uh, you know, six years ago, seven years ago, it was second year when I introduced typing or required typing in my classroom. Now our students can and encourage to type and have to type so much faster. And typing is the new handwriting uh we type all the time so i think it's it's, it's it is an essential skill much it, I, I would argue that it's you know on the priority scale you know hand, typing is number one handwriting is number two uh even with all the benefits of uh uh cognitive you know remem remembering words super useful but it's okay if students uh, do it in block letters. That's 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 fine, I think, uh, because what they gain is ability to type in Russian much faster. Thank you for sharing those thoughts with us, Gany, and actually just kind of thinking back to what you said a moment ago about you know, too much technology. I think I'm seeing quite a bit of that. And it's definitely a balance. We want to make sure that we're engaging students and even related to handwriting, we want to make sure that we are showing them, okay, this is how to type. But also at the same time, we don't always want to go too deep into the technology. We don't want to spend so much time getting the students onboarded into the latest and greatest fad technology and then 
well, we might have lost 20 minutes of time that they could be doing in a breakout room, actually conversing with each other, getting that interpersonal time. And so it's definitely a balance. There is definitely a lot to say on that topic. And we really appreciate all of the input. Oh, Larissa, please chime in. Yes, I just wanted to uh, mention about formative and other function that I use, not uh, always for the online um, class, but for the homework too. So I like this, the homework too that I can assign. I can assign actually um, reading, uh, listening, or watching videos with questions as a homework. Um, and students can reply um, as a, in a written form, or there's many, many different opportunities to show uh, their um, work done. They can even draw a picture for you know different proficiencies. They can actually uh, record audio. Uh, like the audio and I can uh, in a, on a scale then provide a feedback on how well they talk on the topic. So I like this uh, variety and I also like that it could be like a self check too. So um, if I set up the program uh, informative for, for the homework, right? For the homework, uh, they can actually see uh, if they're correct or not correct. You know, some things you still have to read and provide the feedback uh, one case by another, but, uh, you know, some things they can see, oh, I'm not right. So I have to look something else. Um, another thing that formative uh, has and really saves a lot of time for me is that you can actually uh, put the standards for like actual standards there. Um, and uh, students also see that they're working on a standard for, you know, for speaking, for example. Um, they're all very reluctant to speak, by the way. <laughs> Uh, and provide the audio uh, recordings, but uh, with kind of a uh, persuasion that you have to, as part of the language, you have to actually provide, you know, not just one word response, but, um, you know, uh, sentences like a talking paragraphs to get, you know, the better scores on your test. Sometimes you have to even say that a test too, which works for the high schoolers. They want to get this, um, you know, the motivation is to get um, the high school world language credit for the knowledge of the Russian language, um, which is great opportunity for them uh, to um, deepen their language, to learn some academic language, if we're talking about uh, heritage spe speakers too. Um, so like I'm saying, this the technology, uh, too much technology during the class is wrong, but, um, you know, if you don't have uh, somebody who can check you during the week, like I see in my online classes, I see students once a week. That's not really enough. So I assign work uh, for them to do at home, like in a little portion, like I'm telling them at least, you know, 15, 20 minutes a day, you can complete this exercise. So um, I, it, it really works for me. They can record, they can record videos of themselves talking. Um, so I can use formative for instruction, for homework or for the assessment too. So there is a different mode you can put assessment um, and then uh, there will be in a time when they cannot use any other outside tools. So on the computer only formative and they cannot access the Google Translate or something like that for the assessment, for the summative assessment. Um, Another thing I wanted to mention about the uh, phonetics, yes, sometimes it's very hard. And it's hard that I work with students who have different proficiency levels uh, at the same time. Uh, so some things that have to be done, maybe even independently. Um, I use, there is a free program. Uh, the free program is uh, learning, a learning app, uh, learning apps that work, right? So this is a free program, uh, doesn't have any accountability per like points, or you cannot set up a classroom there, but you can set up some uh, exercise for phonetics uh, with a self-check that students actually can work on it. Um, and it could be like a targeted um, intervention with each you know, students um, and some grammar too. So if I have um, you know, a class, I'm not necessarily have a time for the little like a spot check uh, during the class, but I'm assigning some independent work that they can uh, do at home. It's phonics or some grammar exercise with the cases too. 
um, you know, something that if all class needs it, I'll spend some time talking about this. But if, you know, half of the class or maybe three fourths of the class, they, they know all the cases and they know uh, the endings. I'm not going to spend like a grammar lesson just for two students who have, you know, problems with this, but I will assign them some uh, technology to work on this endings and then um, report back to me. Thank you. Thank you for that, Larissa. And yes, that is definitely, it's actually a good segue into my next question. Um, and I actually wanted to start with you on this one, since I know you have talked about working extensively with uh, heritage speakers, those who have that background at home. Um, whenever we're thinking about some of those really great materials, authentic materials out there, uh, great websites you might want to share with your students, and you're kind of looking at those materials how do you find ways to serve both the heritage students that have that background as well as non-heritage students whenever you're looking at these materials and thinking about, okay, how do I adapt this? How do you serve both groups? Yeah, so of course you need to know the the, the level too because heritage speakers could have very different levels too in uh, proficiencies. Um, for, uh, for the program that I'm uh, working now and I worked in another uh, OSPI grant funded programs to online. Um, always important for me to have this knowledge of the students before even uh, uh, lessons. Um, I use some different tools to assess this, like a practice test for event assessments uh, online. It's free for everyone, you can try. Um, and just interviews too, uh, before uh, before classes. Of course, it's hard to, you know, we can provide like a full um, OPI uh, interview, but uh, just to make sure that you know the level of a student. Um, I'll just uh, probably want to share before the answering to this question, a little uh, anecdote. Um, uh, this year for the Startup program, I had a lot of um, uh, students who wanted to participate, uh, 75 75 students wanted to uh, participate in the program. As you know, it was like for 20 seats, right? <laughs> so I had to, I had a lot of interview to do before. Um, and, you know, some shortcuts for me was one shortcut that I found um, uh, an idiom that I would, for students who speak, even like a two, three words, but I they were from the heritage families. Um, uh, the idiom that they had to read and just tell me what it means. And even the students with a like novice meat proficiency who could just answer only by two words, not even in a sentence level, um, if they could explain what it really means, then I said, oh, there's a potential there. So there's a more things that I can like see. There's more than just the level of the language, uh, there is kind of a hidden um, proficiency, like the iceberg, the, what I can see, but there is such more of this, um, you know, the uh, the receptive level, so they can understand much more than they can produce. Uh, so, and then uh, knowing this, uh, the, the students who maybe speak not so fluently, but they can understand more, so um, creating the materials, adapting materials to, to meet their needs. Very often, uh, very often uh, students, the heritage speakers, right? They will understand uh, idioms. They will understand some informal language um, used at home usually. Uh, and students who are not heritage or who are studying it, uh, they will have a very difficult time with this, uh, you know, the suffixes in Russian language, you know, we have a word, uh, for example, Ivan, Vanya, Vanyusha, Ivanushka, right? And they, they're kind of lost. They don't know that it's the same, the same name even, right? So like very specific things. That would be not a problem for students who are from the heritage background. They kind of, they, they don't even see that this is a problem. So if I have in, in a class both, uh, people, uh, students with uh, heritage and non-heritage, they can actually uh, work in rooms and help each other to understand this. Uh, heritage students will have problem and it's harder for them 
to know the formal register. Okay, how we make the formal, like academic language for Russian, they don't have that. So you can actually rephrase one word and they just, the sentence, and they have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, very often for the same uh, level of proficiency for the non-heritage speakers, they have the opposite. So they will know more kind of the bookish language, but not, uh, but not the informal. Uh, so they can help each other with this. Um, also, for the proficiencies that I work with, again, it's, uh, there are many, many different so heritage speakers they have, um, may, may have very different um, things. But with this higher proficiency level that I work with uh, in a program, uh, they um, need help with a written language too. So this will be their the weakest, um, the weakest language, um, the, the weakest domain of the language. Um, and the non-heritage students who are at the same level, uh, briefly, right? For um, they have the opposite. The written will be uh, the highest one of the highest. The spoken language will be not as high. So if during class you pair up uh, students, they can work on their own uh, goals. So I think that's very important to know. Like uh, there is a class goal, but those individual goals for each student. Um, and then we have a lot of online tools. And now with this, the rise of uh, AI, right? Um, it's, it became easier to adapt materials. Again, we have to make sure that we read it carefully and make sure there's no, like you cannot just ask AI to simplify the text, like chat GPT, for example, you can, for the version for zero, you can actually ask uh, uh, to rewrite the text in a different level if you specify the level of the like, actual level of proficiency. However, you do have to read it and very carefully. There are some things that I've seen um, scary <laughs> looking uh, words uh, and correct it. So it's not ideal, uh, but it can save time to prepare materials for different levels in the classroom too. Um, so you can actually uh, use chat GPT and ask to create a, a adapted text for this proficiency level. For this proficiency level, for the age as well. So it can be, okay, adapt this text for intermediate, low, um, 10th grader or 10th, like the um, student. So it, 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 it can be done. And I'm very happy that I don't have to spend hours and hours to rewrite the text. I, I can do it, but it takes a lot of, lot of time. Um, so there's a lot of tools to adapt uh, materials like that. Mm -hmm. um, also thinking about the content goals too. So if you have a, a classroom with a mix, uh, mix levels, uh, you have to always think, what do you want everybody to know? Right, everybody to know. Um, and I had a classes like from novice, from novice me to intermediate high. <laughs> so what do I want all of them to know? And like thinking about this, that yes, maybe if you um, teach the content for the whole class uh, instruction, it could be just the 20% that novice students will understand from what you're uh, right now um, presenting. Then they have pictures to support, you know, the conversation to support the lecture. Um, they have simplified text. They have even like a flashcards with a, a major things that I want them to know. So there's a possibility to kind of make this happen for a multi-level classroom. And I think that will be happening not just in the programs that I teach. I think the trend in the whole, the world language um, uh, teaching is that we will have these different levels in the same in the same classroom. So I think we can um, use online technology to create these materials to meet all the needs. Um, I think I did cover that, didn't I? Definitely. And I like how you asked that question of what 
what is it that I really want the whole class to know and having that ultimately drive what you're presenting. I love that answer. Thank you. Uh, Shannon, going to you, please. And the question again was, how do we serve both heritage and non-heritage learners when we are looking to take some of those authentic materials and adapt them so all of our students can use them? For a few of the questions that we have today, I have very specific things to share. And this one is one of those, which is, um, I just wanted everyone to know if you ha if you don't know already that there's a set of materials that's specifically for heritage learners that um, it was created by a team from the uh, Middlebury School of Russian, which included me and Jason Merrill, Irina Dubinina and Alessia Kisilov. And um, those materials are all uh, available free online for anyone to use. And um, they could be, they're online materials, completely online. And uh, so there are various ways that you could use them. Um, but I just wanted to share the way we use them at Michigan State, where I uh, teach during the normal uh, academic year. Our program is not really large enough to have a separate class for heritage learners. But what my colleague Jason Merrill does is he, uh, in the fall of every year, he offers a special topics course that's one or two credits that is specifically for heritage learners and they use the materials that are online on the, at the Middlebury site. And the idea is that since most of our courses that they're going to be um, engaging with are geared more towards traditional students, the hope is that uh, these materials that focus on what um, heritage learners need, which um, as Larissa pointed out, often tend to, to be the kind of the opposite of what traditional students need. Um, so these materials uh, focus on those things that they need in particular. And the hope is that then that will allow them to then get more out of the courses that they take that are more focused on traditional learners. And so um, I also agree with what uh, Larissa was saying about the idea that online materials often give us the uh, ability to differentiate a little more uh, because we can uh, take maybe one text and have different tasks for it, or we can have uh, scaffolding that we provide that's used if necessary, but not used if not necessary. So those are the two things I wanted to add to, to this part of the conversation. Excellent. And yes, it does give us a lot of freedom to adapt things and maybe use things for one part, and then I can switch over and use something completely different for something else. So I, I do love that freedom that we get in the online world. Thank you for that. And then let's go to Evgeny. Again, it was the same question. And that question is, how do we serve both of those groups, the heritage learners and the non-heritage learners, whenever we are looking to adapt authentic materials? My first answer to this there are multiple answers but the first answer is exactly by using authentic materials we're serving both heritage and non-heritage because um i like to use texts that have different levels of depth and different levels of interpretation understanding the text like masha lubit sir ana pokupait sir there's no much interpretation there's no much side meanings or uh, authors intentions and emotions uh, but if we take any any poem any, any short story any Facebook posts uh, right it is authentic material um, I always in my presentation I always cite example when I when I saw a post of my colleague who was congratulating uh, women on uh, women's uh, day and I was a she said something. Поздравляю всех мам, бабушек, тёть, девушек, etc. It's like, oh, that's perfect for genitive plural. That's such a gift to me. That's that's authentic text I want to use, real life uh, use of language. So, and uh, non heritage students will maybe get to the the base level, the first level of the text, the surface level, and heritage speakers will be able to see depth and something else, some, some something that's um, they are able to interpret and analyze and um, 
uh, and take it to a different level. I think vocabulary is certainly a big issue, and we should we need to think how we um, scaffold the vocabulary, introduce vocabulary, and um, uh, um, vocabulary lists uh, for non heritage speakers would be certain certainly the words that they may not know. Uh, and and heritage speakers will use it to review maybe spelling, maybe some nuances of meaning, uh, but certainly vocabulary list, lists uh, is something that we, if we talk about text in kind of a traditional uh, sense of this word, uh, will will be, will be something that uh, we need to we need to use and help our learners to make the most of the text, and also uh, um, text adaptation which can take different forms um you might be familiar with the resource again created by Middlebury colleague Tatiana Smarodinskaya that I'm going to put in the chat uh that introduces some kanonicheski text texts like mumu or uh, Chanel uh and they introduce them in three or two or three versions uh as um the original author wrote them, and then uh, uh, other versions will will be more and more adapted and abridged. So that's something we can certainly use with uh, with different uh, audiences. And uh, non heritage will will be assigned uh, version one of this text, um, and um, heritage speakers, depending on their ability, will be assigned a less abridged version. So. Glossing is something that we we need to uh, we need to think about it. Gloss within the text. Gloss something that we 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 don't want to cut from the text, uh, but we we want students to maybe pay attention and to to notice and to um, to understand to get the flavor of the text. And um, again, authentic texts, as we all know, give us cultural. Uh, knowledge and I, I would I would argue that every authentic text has some culture and for for heritage students it will be sort of a refining and adding some nuances to the knowledge about the culture about the knowledge uh about the understanding how their parents or grand great parents lived how um people from their you know region uh live or lived and for for non heritage students, it will be maybe more abstract information, something that does not have a direct relevance to their lives, but certainly new and um, new and exciting. So the choice of the authentic texts, the the variety of them, the variety of topics, right? It shouldn't be just you know Pushkin. All right, we all love Pushkin. We all think that everybody should know who who he is and uh read his poems but there are other great texts that that are um, uh, available that are accessible to our learners and maybe the road to pushkin could be paved by less known poets and less important texts but uh the appreciation of literature i think we could we should also be be building and we be use should be using simpler texts so that students develop that critical skills to develop this analysis of um of um uh of, of work of art and I also what what I what I always try to do in my classes regardless of the uh level is uh teach them appreciation of the work of art so that it's not just the dative case I take from Tsvetaeva's poem, right? You know, perfect examples of the Nravitsa construction, but there's so much more uh, to this poem than the dative case. So even if this conversation happens in English, which, you know, some people will all be happy about, but, uh, you know, we're teaching culture too. And sometimes... It's unavoidable. It's we have to use English as uh, you know um, when when we introduce the work of art, a film, uh, something something that requires um, maybe historical context. You know, we all like film courier, 
right? Uh, but uh, it's essential that we give uh, some historical introduction and something that explains the main character's behavior. Otherwise, people say, ah, he's a jerk. He just, uh, he's a bad, bad, bad person. Uh, without thinking in which era and which time uh, the main character was living in. So that in, in historical and cultural introduction to a lot of films and texts these days is essential and is something that allows that um, that mm, a closer interaction and more meaningful analysis of, 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 of the text. I love that you brought culture into it, and I definitely want to come back to that topic in just a moment. So thank you for that answer. And then, Olga, the question going to you now, how do we serve both heritage and non-heritage learners whenever we're looking to adapt those authentic materials and use them in our online classrooms? Yeah, so and I have to agree with the previous speakers that it is important to see, uh, important to choose the materials that uh, allow us for differentiation and also can be adapted to different proficiency levels. Sometimes the proficiency levels can be uh, for in a mixed group. Sometimes prof different proficiency levels can be in the same group. Like heritage speakers can be different proficiency levels. Or even uh, non-heritage speakers, uh, learners, uh, L2 learners, can have profici different proficiency levels, especially after first year. Let's say if after first year, it's or even after first semester. And especially in advanced levels, at least that's what I've been experiencing. And that's why I would know I know what I noticed that authentic websites uh, for things like we want students to be prepared uh, for, let's say, potential trip uh, to to go to this uh, study abroad, right? On on study abroad trip, so maybe they will be traveling or maybe they will be working. And using these materials that are already there created for uh, native speakers for their daily activities, I thought that this was helpful. And what um, for heritage speakers, this will be also learning a little bit more about culture, what Evgeny mentioned, or it will be learning about the culture that they don't know about at all because they haven't been exposed to this culture, especially if they haven't traveled to the uh, home country of their uh, relatives, right, and their family. So, and these the websites which we've been using in our programs were websites for stores, like clothing and students will go and they learn some of the, like Talstovka, they might not even know this <laughs> in Russian, or maybe their parents didn't know this word in Russian because the Talstovki were not popular 30 years ago when they moved to the United States, right, or grocery stores, because definitely there are in, a lot of interesting things that you can find there, movie theaters, uh, theaters, uh, like ordering, ordering tickets. And then especially uh, like I uh, students enjoy when these are forms, like any websites that have some kind of like fillable forms. So it's like reservation at restaurants, right? And um, uh, hospitals, like finding a appointment. Many you can find now websites for different hospitals in Russian speaking countries where you can choose the doctor, choose the time, you can reserve it. Right. So we play with students. They create this like reservations. I just tell them, don't press on submit. <laughs> just do a screenshot. And this is the the final kind of outcome. Any uh, web, university websites where you have to fill out the form for like study abroad or request information about like uh, information like brochure. So we've been using these kind of websites as well. And um, uh, travel agencies, uh, for example, to book excursions. So. This is just some of the ideas which we use. But, uh, and I, what I found useful in these websites, because very often they have small chunks of the language and they might have also a little bit more of descriptions, right? Which is for novice learners, it might be a lot of cognates, especially if these are restaurants, if they are doctor's offices, theaters, some of the things like this, right? They also have, many of them have images, like menu, I mean, restaurants have menus with images online. Um, and then uh, also uh, it's uh, helpful is, is it supported with visual clues, right? Both for like low level uh, proficiency students and more advanced proficiency students. And uh, for heritage students, as I said, they, they will be learning. Oh, so that's how you book your appointment. You can actually get an appointment to the doctors for today, right? You just go and get this online talon check, <laughs> right? And uh, Another thing which I found very useful, doing um, virtual excursions, any kind of virtual excursions where, with authentic materials. And these um, 
just a list of some excursions which we've I've been using. They they published on uh, on some um, websites. Or these are just examples which we use. The Kremlin Museum has an an amazing virtual excursion. Uh, Arujena Palata and other uh, museums, and you can also find other uh, museums from all over the country, from even uh, non-central part of Russia. You can find some websites for virtual museums in, uh, and excursions in like Siberia, for example, or Kareli uh, in pl other places. And I found this useful again, because the materials, the input can be very simple. <laughs> there will be some of these virtual muse uh, museums have actually uh, audio uh, recordings. So that's also great because you can uh, give them opportunities to practice their uh, listening comprehension skills. Some of them just have written. So again, you can differentiate what you want to focus. If you're for your heritage speakers, you want them to fo focus more on reading rather than listening because their usual listening skills, most of them have already some uh, listening skills developed. You can just say, okay, you need to read the the, the description of this specific uh, ex exhibition or this specific painting, for example. And um, also it uh, you can differentiate using this authentic materials. Right? They created four speakers of, of Russian. You can differentiate the task, what you want them to do with this material, depending whether they're heritage speakers or non-heritage speakers. And I think the three other websites which I found very useful, they're um, not necessarily like, they're not specifically created by Russians for Russians, but I found their Russian materials. Uh, and these are the three, uh, the Dollar Street through GameFinder, Windows, uh, you can watch, uh, look through Windows, and you can also walk on the streets of the um, specific uh, cities. And these, uh, all these websites have on their list have some Russian speaking uh, cities. They might have like, they have also some places outside Russia. I mean, they may have Latvia, Litva, they have Ukraine, right? The former Soviet republics. And uh, I have created a lot of activities using these websites and I had both heritage and non-heritage speakers and they learned a lot of new stuff. For example, heritage speakers in this first resource where it was the, Dollar Street. It has the items of uh, household items and uh, daily items of a regular family who lives, let's say, in Riga or who lives in uh, Kazan or who lives in um, Kharkiv or some places like this. And then there is description of this play uh, of these items also in Russian. And they will learn some of them. Maybe they don't know Gribishok, <laughs> right? Like uh, they might know like Rashoska, but they might know Gribishok and things like this, which is for heritage speakers also expanding a little bit on the vocabulary they might be using in their limited environment, right? If they're just only using the language within their family, with the family, like immediate family. So I, I found this useful. And again, it's that what they do with this, uh, what we do, right, as teachers with this, resources, that's what helps us to differentiate and to target specific uh, skills, set a set of skills, depending on whether they have the speakers, not have the speakers, whether you want them to work on specifically on listening comprehension, whether you want to work on the uh, on the vocabulary and things like this. So these are just a few things that I wanted to share for for this part of the <laughs> our uh, webinar. I love that. I love how you made connections to just some normal everyday things and everyday situations. And I absolutely love the idea of asking your students to fill out forms. Um, I can vouch as somebody who recently traveled and got sick on the trip. It's really important to know how to access a doctor. So I love the idea of students going in and not clicking submit. We wouldn't want the doctor in St. Petersburg to see that their next patient is someone named Schmidt who lives in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. <laughs> But I love that idea. Thank you so much for sharing those ideas with us, Olga. And now talking again about authentic materials, but I'd love to know a little bit more about how you use authentic materials to add cultural lessons for your students into your online content. Olga, if you don't mind, I'd love to start with you on that question since you were oh. talking about just everyday oh, things. Okay, sorry, I didn't realize. Yes, yeah, so uh, I mentioned already the resources, but I can just give you a couple of examples. For example, the excursions, right? I chose my students to work in pairs and they would go to the, I will 
give them a list of virtual excursions, like a few museums, and I would assign a specific museum to a student. Sometimes I would just ask them, like, choose the museum of their of your liking, right? And they need to follow this, and they will go there, go to this virtual museum, and they uh, I give them a task. It's like a scavenger hunt, and that's what I think that is. Uh, interesting and helpful with, for students is like to create some kind of um, uh, a game, right? It's like a scavenger hunt. You, you need to do this and this. You need to find couple items. For example, you need to find couple items that are from, let's say, the 19th century. You need to find a couple items that were created by female um, artists, female, uh, you know, create uh, cultural producers, something like this. You need to find, for example, two items that you like the most and you need to explain. So, and they will go, for example, it's it's a form as a, a, a graphic organizer and they need to walk around, stroll around, uh, check what they, like trying to check the information and then fill out this uh, form. And uh, the final, uh, the final results will be like them sharing their find uh, findings in in the classroom. So and it it was we could do we did this in the past both online. We did this also in person when students could use their iPads and the computers uh, in the classroom, and then they would talk in the classroom, reporting back about the items that they found. Right. So it's definitely this is the cultural. They're learning about the cultural aspects. Also the uh, like museum, uh, not museums, but movie theaters and. Uh, for example, I would tell them, okay, you can go to these websites, but you need to find the information. You need to find one of the uh, films that you're going to watch tonight, right? You're you're in this country, you're in this city, but you need, or from the whole list of the movies they're showing this week, you need to find the ones that are made by uh, either Russian speaking film directors or like film directors from the former Soviet Union. So you need to find, so they start searching, right? Looking for the films. And some of them, it will be easy because if they have images, they might recognize, oh, this is Hollywood, right? This is Tom Cruise. This is definitely not the film. So these are like, they have the visual cues there, but then they will find, and then you can uh, give them some time depending on the level, right? If these are more advanced students, they can do independent research online and say, okay, here's like, find a little bit, go to v Wikipedia, Russian Wikipedia and find uh, a little bit more information about this filmmaker or about this film. And then say, tell uh, tell your students, other students, why we all should go and watch this film tonight, right? So it's like your task uh, is to pursue, persuade them to watch this specific movie and not the movie with Tom Cruise, for example, right? So, and uh, that's just a couple of things. It's just we're recreating semi-authentic experience right or the same thing with the menus and restaurants i would tell them i will give them a few uh, websites to work with but then they need to to have small debates and kind of make all their classmates all their group mates to go to this specific restaurant because this restaurant is the best in terms of pricing in terms of uh, uh, choices in terms of uh, like i don't know if you have allergies and different dietary restrictions again based on students' uh, individual experiences and their backgrounds. For example, I use, okay, do you guys have any allergies? Oh, you are gluten-free. Uh, you are glu uh, uh, you're allergic to gluten. You all cannot do this. You're not uh, eating meat, for example. You're vegetarian. And now you choose them. So, and that's what I found really good. And the restaurants which I include, it will be restaurants from Russian-speaking uh, countries, but also the ones from like uh, Georgia, um, uh, Uzbekistan and food that we also eat and we appreciate a lot people from the former Soviet Union but somehow very often in our textbooks we we'll only have like borscht and then blini and then pinne <laughs> and then students don't know what is hachipuria is they don't know what is I don't know satsivi is and stuff like this even though like many of us know them of this and this is the cultural aspect that can be introduced I love all those ideas and I, many of my students as well as myself, I'm very food motivated. So anything related to food, we can train them to go and do. Thank you for sharing that with us. Shannon, I'd like to ask you next, please. And again, the question is, how do you use authentic materials to add cultural lessons and components into your online content? Again, I have something very specific to share and I'm really excited to share it because it's hot off the presses. Um, it, we haven't even announced it yet, but um, my colleague Anna Tumarkin and I have completed uh, an open educational resource. This is a, 
an, an online textbook that um, is free, it, it's interactive. And um, it's, its title is Diverse Russian. And I think Jim will put the, uh, the, um, the link into the chat. But um, I want to tell you a little bit about the the book um, because it has culture at its at its heart, really. Um, as all of us know, um, the last two years, one of the things that we've been um, struggling with a little bit is like like what Olga just said is that um, a lot of our materials that we have focus mostly on Russia. Whereas because of the war, our students aren't studying in Russia anymore, at least right now, and they are studying in other uh, places where there are Russian speaking communities. And so this open educational resource is meant to introduce them to places where Russian is, where, where there are Russian speaking communities. And it's chock full of, of authentic materials and, and culture. And it introduces uh, each, it has chapters on Ukraine. Kazakhstan, um, non-Russian populations in Russia, the Baltics, Sakartvelo or Georgia, and then the United States as well. And so um, we're hoping that this will be uh, a supplemental text to intermediate, intermediate level textbooks, and we'll hopefully be able to introduce students to culture using the Russian language. And just to add to that, one of, this is one of the ways in which I think online materials and online uh, online learning can shine because uh, one of the things that uh, we tried really hard in the book is to have it be flexible for students of different levels. And since culture, as Evgeny mentioned, he talked about not wanting to simplify texts sometimes and but culture texts that have a lot of cultural content require a lot of support and uh, online tools can allow us to include that support but have it be available only when needed so that students of different levels can access it if they need it but sort of ignore it if they don't need it and so i think that's one way in which online materials can really shine in the introduction or in the um inclusion of culturally rich materials because that support that is often needed can be uh, provided in ways that are maybe less obtrusive or easier to easier to use in some ways. And so I hope everybody will check out our book. We're going to be um, announcing it soon and um, hope it will be useful for people. Much appreciated. Everyone loves a good OER. So thank you so much for taking the time to share that with us, especially we kind of are getting a little bit of an exclusive. So thank you for sharing that with us. And yes, it is nice sometimes in the online environment, it's easier to put that scaffolding in, in some cases and kind of impose it where you can add it. But some populations might not need it. Uh, maybe if we have some heritage learners that are uh, maybe lived most of their life in operating in the target language they might not need that extra scaffolding but somebody coming in uh, truly as a novice low just parroting what we're telling them they might need that scaffolding and it's, it is easy sometimes in that online environment to add it thank you for that um, Evgeny asking you the same question again talking about the culture and, and jumping back into that topic can you tell us more about how you use authentic materials to add that cultural component into your online content um, yeah, I, I mentioned uh, some of this brief, briefly in my previous uh, answer, and I first of all, I want to applaud Shannon for this resource and thank her for this tremendous work uh, she and Anna uh, did. It's, it's very commendable. I like the balanced approach, how you uh, include you know, uh, uh, both Russia and non-Russia in this resource. And I think this is something we need to be thinking now more than we we did in the past what culture we teach what is it we teach what is this uh what is the content uh how is an important question but now selecting of selection of material thinking about uh a, a diverse but balanced perspective that our students uh, deserve to get uh, is something that I've been thinking a lot and um, uh, also thinking about my own expertise and something that I, what I know, what I, what I, where, 
places I've traveled, what I've seen in firsthand, what I've been trained in. Uh, and I, I think that's kind of also goes back into what exactly we teach and what kind of culture we introduce into our students. Do we have a responsibility to teach our students some canonical texts like Tatiana Smarodinska introduces in her website, you know, they should know, you know, Chanel and Mamou and, you know, Mertwe uh, or we should st steer towards more, you know, contemporary culture uh, and um, kind of a, a, maybe not so, not so um, important works of art. Richard Robin, who we all we know, and uh, uh, admire as a pedagogue, as a textbook writer, used to say, the worse, the better. <laughs> Чем хуже, тем лучше. You, meaning, speaking about the language of, for example, TV shows and uh, uh, soap operas. He said, well, that's if, the, if they're speaking in the cliche language and say, oh, I love you or something like that, you know, that's perfect. That's gold for language classroom. And that's so that's one approach. So we pick something that's, mass produced and has seen you know, a kind of a, a familiar content repetitive structure uh shablon music and then our students can gain language um um i i do think we have responsibility to to introduce tarkovsky malevich uh you know something um something that's outside of our students kind of meeting immediate field of view uh, that's how we do it is 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 in, in, in the, the systematic way the systematicity of this is also something I, I I've been thinking a lot so a lot of times we introduce things kind of a um not randomly but without without a system and there's no textbooks or there's no guidelines that say okay you know first introduce Krasna Ploshit, then talk about Tchaikovsky, and then talk about Gagarin, and then talk. There's no hierarchy of kind of a concepts and uh, figures and uh, events and works of uh, literature. Uh, I don't know if we need one. Maybe we should also be guided by our own understanding what uh, what constitutes what what goes into culture. What what's important. What's what's less important. Um, and I also want to emphasize the importance of stories. This is something that we uh, we used a lot as we were writing the second year textbook. Uh, a lot of culture is introduced through personal narratives. Um, and I think especially now when things are so sensitive, so raw, so, so kind of... Um, um, uh, so difficult to to teach sometimes i think by um bringing real voices real people real stories they may be modified they may be slightly adapted uh that's not the point the point is that we introduce real voices from 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 our world to our classroom and have our students learn culture through the lens of the eyes of these people who you know who lived in Russia, who lived in Ukraine, who uh, I don't know um, uh, experienced something fun or tragic or or important, and that 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 helps to create this connection and make this meaningful conversation discussing the lived experience of the person in the story and the lived experience of our learners. Uh, and that's something that can connect heritage speakers and non-heritage speakers and native speakers and, and ourselves, right? I think we we often neglect neglect our own kind of a, a um, experience and importance of that experience for, for, the, for the classroom and for our students. Oftentimes the most interesting stories they hear in the classroom is from us stories from our childhoods, stories from our youth and our travels. So um, I would encourage, you know, for you to think about your own stories and start collecting stories you hear from others or read on uh, online and have uh, the stories uh, kind of in different versions, maybe for your novice classroom, for your intermediate classroom, for your advanced classroom.
you brought up a really good point about storytelling and how that does build connections. Even if you think back to some of those beloved stories from childhood, the things that just, you know, really pull you in and, and really can essentially keep our learners motivated, keep them wanting to sign up for Russian 2, Russian 3, hopefully Russian 4 and beyond. And yes, making those connections with the students, sharing your own travel stories. For me, that was a big motivator, hearing stories from my language teachers and getting to hear more about their experiences and hopefully getting to experience those things myself someday. That was a huge motivator for me and a great way to keep those students engaged. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. And then Larissa, asking you the same question, please. How do you use authentic materials to add cultural lessons and components into your own online content? Oh, yeah, so I um, agree with Olga and Evgeny, Shannon. Um, I would add a little bit uh, that I, I also use the resources that Olga uses for um, for the tours, uh, for the tours. Also, um, Google Maps is a great resource that you can actually um, like go to the Nevsky Prospect and see things around like in the real time. So far, it works. <laughs> Um, and you know, go to the different restaurants. Uh, so here's the menu, uh, or if there is a more advanced uh, language, you can have a complication. So kind of setting up uh, the scenario that they have to uh, act on. Um, for example, you can, for the students, you can say you have a limited budget um, or you live in a particular area and you have only two hours to where you have to get from point A to point B, and then they have to figure out how to do that um, using the public transportation, and of course, providing all these uh, websites for them to uh, see, right? Not just kind of um, open up the Google and say, okay, you go and find. So uh, have a list of the uh, website that they can use for this uh, research. Um, or you can say, okay, you are um, planning uh, a winter holidays in St. Petersburg and you and your parents are going to St. Petersburg for a visit. You're going to be there for two days and then, um, or two weeks, maybe. Um, you're flying from point A to point B. How, how are you going to get to the, from the airport to, to your hotel? Um, so it's something that uh, really they use the authentic materials but very often um, there's a lot of the simple language and a lot of uh, pictures there. Um, another thing that I like to use is um, through the culture that rule also is afisha. So uh, for example, when uh, we had the spring celebration at Maslinice, uh, we look at the afisha and students in pairs. So there was kind of interpersonal communication while there too. They had to, uh, look through the different events and choose one that um, they like the best. It'll be for more uh, simple task. And again, with a complication for more advanced learners. Um, it could be a budget or it could be some allergies or it could be something that they cannot stand or, you know, um, they, they are living in point A and they have to be something close to that point. So there are more, com more, more complication for more advanced levels. And also it's kind of very, very authentic, very fun, a lot of pictures, simple language, um, but they have to really work together to, to get this information. I like to get the uh, afterwards a presentation. So they have to tell the class exactly like the whole group, uh, where they're going to go and why. Um, maybe even put it in a writing or have like a slide for the, uh, like in Google slides and show, okay, we're going right here because these events would like to visit there. Um, you can play and say uh, role play to again, uh, change the tenses to like talk about, um, you know, a different person going there, um, maybe a different persona. So there's a lot of things you can do with this authentic materials online that can be found. Um, another thing I wanted to say um, to add to Evgeny's very important to share stories um, that we possess or you know our mothers, fathers, grandfathers. And since majority of my students are heritage speakers, they also have stories. Um, and it's it's something you have to create a very safe environment for them to share. Um, but once they feel comfortable, right? It's kind of building this classroom culture too. Um, sharing about um, their parents or somebody else. Since not everybody 
ready to share. I would always give another choice to maybe find online and read a story or listen to the video or listen to the audio or video. Um, but majority of the students actually, they, you know, interview their parents or grandparents. Um, and like last year, um, we talk about World War II and about the war veterans. I also like to start the lesson with an authentic picture. Like the viewing a picture is, is authentic material. So for example, picture uh, taken in a uh, Park Pobeda, uh, veteran in a skameki. So like uh, two veterans sitting on the, um, on the bench celebrating the victory day. Very, very authentic picture, like uh, people there. And then we discuss that kind of warming up and uh, students will say, oh, I notice, uh, I wonder, I have a question about it. So having this discussion on a real picture, real people um, from the present time too. Um, and then we slowly like get to the next, uh, when they discuss and um, look at this and uh, answer each other's questions. And then after that, I introduced, you know, some topic and uh, uh, things. And um, our was the sharing role modeling, I would say about my grandmother, who, you know, have a whole presentation for grandmother. And then um, they know what to do. And then they uh, interview their grandmothers or somebody from the internet. They can find somebody like, oh, they might say it's not, it's just a person that my parents know. They don't have to, they can be anonymously. Again, it's could be the sensitive uh, topic nowadays too. Um, so they have a chance to to stay anonymously, to stay anonymously. And then the presentation that they uh, created about their uh, relatives and grandparents were just so touchy. And then everybody kind of seeing that, oh, we all have like a similar background um, and we connected like in, in history and time. I also like to use songs uh, for my own time. I'm a perestroika person who was living in, in Russia at that time. And it's lately actually became very current too. There are some things we discuss. Um, and using the authentic text of the song of a group of kino, um, very simple text, a lot you have to explain if people don't know like when it was written, why it was written and, and, and so on. Um, they might say, oh, well, the music is not actually that, that advanced, right? Or, um, but you know, the history behind all these words, um, first make them uh, interested in learning more about it. Um, so this is, I think the higher praise that can be for our lessons is when students uh, beyond the classroom, they go and ask these questions and have some interest in it, um, which I've seen that and I'm really happy to, to see that. Um, when they learn one thing and they want to learn more, even you know, not in our classroom control time. Uh, I think this is our the biggest goal that we want them to to be the the learners who are going to continue their study, you know, with us or without us, have some critical thinking uh, going. And authentic materials can actually provide this base of study, you know, later on when they're you know not even in our classroom. I really love that you mentioned songs because I think that's an often very overlooked way to hook students into the culture and, and the music and, and even the language learning, learning new vocabulary words that they might not have encountered in our textbooks. And I like how you also talked about how we want to encourage them to continue to keep studying. We are all lifelong learners and we will continue to learn and, and grow even all of us personally in our lives. So I like the idea of bringing in things like music, like songs that people can connect with and they're motivated to keep studying. Thank you for that. Excellent. So for the last part, I well, two things I wanted to do. Um, I do eventually want to open up. Uh, if there are questions from the audience, we'd love to field those. But I kind of want to do a little bit of a rapid fire round uh, with all of our panelists. And actually, Larissa, if we can start with you, that would be great, because you mentioned a little bit about uh, using AI tools. And I wondered if you might be able to briefly share uh, maybe any lessons learned or uh, some brief experiences that you've had with using AI in in some way, shape, or form in your classroom. I'd love to hear about that. Um, well, uh, I learned that it's really saving our time, especially if you need to simplify the text. 
uh, it also can help you to uh, create um, some tables, uh, create some visuals that will accompany the lesson. Um, I use a lot uh, the function of a copilot. It's uh, a Microsoft um, AI uh, generated tool uh, where students can uh, type uh, the description and then uh, they will see the picture like with this description. Um, it's very uh, game-like for them to do that, but they also see how well they can describe something. Like, is this what you want to actually um, see at the end as a product of it? Um, and then they have also like a pictures uh, matching with the descriptions too. So here's a picture and it's uh, uh, created by Copilot by me um, before that. And then say, okay, here's description and here's picture, where is it? And sometimes with like more advanced uh, proficiency, you can have like a little, little um, different things, but they have to notice that in a description, in a text, it says it has to be na stalie, nie pat stalom, ili nie okolo stala, and so on. So um, kind of a great tool. Um, and then I will never be able to draw a picture like that, or, you know, if not co-pilot that I have to, I don't know, I have to draw it or I have to, yeah, spend hours and hours finding it uh, online, but here's, I can use that. Um, and again, students can do it too, have the relationship with this. Um, you can deconstruct the text uh, for different levels. Again, it, well, does not, it's not probably the authentic, but sometimes we have to do this for, for the content and, you know, for the language proficiencies too. Um, so that's easier to do too, much easier than um, do it just without uh, AI help, but also have to be careful with this too. You have to be a good expertise in it because sometimes when I wanted a picture for to show students one particular thing, but it was completely not that. And it's not culturally sensitive too. <laughs> so um, yes, I have to really proofread it and look at the pictures and then show what is appropriate or not. So it's a good tool, but you cannot rely on it like 100%, but um, you can use it and make your teaching fun uh, and interactive too. Um, that's what I wanted to say. And, uh, you know, with the presentations too, uh, again, if you want, if you have a very interesting content and you want to make sure all the proficiencies or understand what you're talking about, uh, AI can help you with this visual uh, representation of the main ideas too. Excellent. And definitely I would echo the importance of really vetting anything that AI produces as <laughs> it's often not quite ready right out of the gate and it often requires some uh, modifications. I didn't have really have much artistic talent, so I I would agree that it's a huge time saver, especially for generating those photos you might need. Thank you for that. Uh, and again, we'll kind of go a little bit rapid fire here. Uh, Shannon would love to hear your thoughts about maybe some lessons learned from using any AI tools you might have used in your own Russian classroom. Actually, the thing that comes to mind, I used in a literature and translation class, but I think it could be modified for a language class. I had students read a story by Stanislav Lem, which uh, is kind of uncannily predicting chat GPT. And then we sort of talked about the text and how it's similar. Um, how did he uh, predict this, uh, et cetera. And then I had students, um, it, it was from a collection called the Siberiad that had uh, basically fairy tales, but that were set uh, on various planets with with these these wizard constructors. And all of the stories within that collection had certain uh, features. And so I had students ask ChatGPT to write a new version of something that would fit into that collection of stories. And then they had to assess the output and then improve it. And so I think, like I said, I used this in a class where students were native speakers of English and we were using English, but I think it could be modified for a, a higher level, maybe a class in Russian where you ask them to sort of co-write something with ChatGPT could be interesting. I think one of the most important things for us right now is to make sure that they are being critical about what comes out, <laughs> right? So, um, make sure they're not just taking it uh, without looking at it and thinking about it. 
I love the idea. That sounds like an incredibly fun assignment, but also one that might help our students to understand the importance of academic integrity and the need to vet content that comes out of ChatGPT. I love the idea. Thank you for that, Shannon. And then if Getty, the same question kind of going a little bit rapid fire, do you have any lessons learned or stories you want to share about using AI in your online Russian classroom? Sure. I use a lot of uh, ChatGPT in my kind of a professional um, correspondence, uh, but very little in teaching. I find artificial intelligence to be um, not smart enough to a to send my students, first year students to just even simple stuff because chat GPT will make stuff uh, stuff up and will inevitably kind of a uh, uh, be not helpful and not not um, not uh, correct often. So my extent of using chat GPT in the classroom is okay, create <laughs> sort of fill in the blanks sentences uh, on the topic of I don't know food and use the verbs of positioning. and that's that's that what it does great. Uh, um, things like that. Uh, but I am still staying away from. Uh, having my students interact with G chat GPT on a kind of a full scale basis and have assignments uh, based on chat GPT. I, I know it's, you know, I'm, I'm probably not doing my students uh, a favor, but I think uh, we need to kind of wait until uh, this technology becomes uh, sort of a foolproof for our pedagogical purposes and for our novice and timid classroom before we start using it uh, more, more widely. I completely understand where you're coming from, from that. And in the online environment, as much as we love to be able to give students real-time feedback, that's got to be accurate. And as we talked about before, it's very important to vet the content that comes out of AI and if we are not there to do that for them, we don't want our students to learn things that aren't going to help them. So yeah. I it's definitely getting there, understand. But it's not there yet. It's not there yet. It, it, from, we're, from not, yeah. we're not there yet. I would agree with that. Definitely. Thank you. And then Olga, again, same question, kind of going a little bit rapid fire. Can you share with us maybe some lessons learned or experiences that you had using AI in your online Russian classroom? Mm -hmm. So we, as, as Eugenia, I was a little bit uh, hesitant to use ChatGPT, but at the same time, uh, I've been talking to my students a lot. I, I was asking about the experience and in our, I think, midterm evaluations, in one of the midterm evaluations back uh, in the fall, we found out the students actually want to be educated a little bit more. They're like, they also were not sure what to do with ChatGPT. Some of them, of course, went ahead and started, to, you know, breaking all the codes of conduct <laughs> and plagiarizing. But many of them actually just said that we don't know what to do. We are afraid of touching it, a little bit hesitant. And I actually started introducing, like, first of all, the policies, including very clear policies about chat GPT in your course uh, uh, descriptions, also on your uh, learning management system, your learning management system, everywhere where there was like independent component, we would remind the chat GPT and any uh, in artificial intelligence tools, they they are going to get students in trouble. Well, it's just to remind because apparently some of them didn't realize that too. <laughs> so we cannot assume some basic things. But uh, what we did, like I did include it, introduce several activities where I use ChatGPT, special image generation uh, uh, generating um, uh, tools, and these were very beneficial. That was uh, amazing experiences because I think that. Uh, they can AI tools can uh, enhance students' experiences. Create by if we create a specific list, text, images, we can ask them, and we that what we ask like to generate a list of like packing list for uh, to travel to Sochi, and these students will ask Chat GPT to create a list to travel in the in the uh, winter to Magadan, and then they will use a list, but then they will have to describe and co construct full sentences about what they need to pack what I want to take with me, right? Things like this. So it's kind of like an like outline, using this as outlines. And uh, But at the same time, we did, and I'm hoping to, uh, since Flip no longer is going to be available and we cannot use it with our learning management system, which I've been using a lot in my language classes for, for, for years. So I'm planning to experiment with the chat GPT as, as a speaking 
as a speaking partner on the phone. So now we, I tested, it is possible to do this. We've been working with students, my students were doing writing, interpersonal writing, interpersonal communication through writing where they were corresponding and writing with ChatGPT, asking questions, following up uh, with uh, follow-up questions, but I also want to, for them to, to use them as speaking partners because now you can do this since May and it's free and we'll see where it will take us. But definitely we need to be careful we definitely need to educate our students about this. And that's my, that's the lessons that I have learned so far in my interaction with uh, AI tools so far. Much appreciated. And yes, it is really important as educators to lay that groundwork. If you plan on bringing AI into the classroom, making it really clear about what the expectations are and where the boundaries are in terms of keeping our academic integrity agreements intact. Thank you all very much for this. Uh, what I would love to do now is uh, if anyone from our audience has any questions, if you would like to uh, turn your microphone on or type into the chat, uh, we've covered so many topics, but if anybody from our audience has anything to ask our panel, we would warmly take those questions. Um, and Julia, yes, the, all of these sessions are archive recorded. They will be available for all of us to watch and rewatch over the years on our NFLRC website. Thank you for that. Uh, but yes, we'd love to take any questions. And as we're waiting for questions to come in, uh, Jim very kindly posted the link to our feedback survey for the panel. If you could please take a moment to provide that feedback, as we do plan to do more sessions like this in the future, and obviously not just for the Russian, but for other languages as well, we'd love to get your feedback to see how we can improve and make these sessions even better. So please, if you could take a moment to fill out that, that'd be appreciated. But yes, any questions, or if anybody would like to turn their microphone on or even camera on and ask a question to our panel, please feel free to do so. Well, okay, so if nobody wants to ask, because my question is pretty simple, that's why I was kind of hesitating. Uh, um, so we talked a lot about breakout rooms and how great um, <clears throat> the tool is. So, but um, I was wondering if, especially Evgeny, because you like said a lot that your students are so excited about breakout rooms and everything. So, but did you talk about beginners or, you know, more advanced students like intermediate level? Because I noticed that uh, breakout rooms for some reason are not like very successful in my case when I teach, for instance, semester one you know, or semester two, because um, it feels like they really need more money, like monitoring from me. And uh, even if I visit every room, I kind of, I, I didn't find it very productive, you know, because they, they really need more teacher's guidance. So that's kind of my uh, observation, but I was wondering your opinion on that. Right. Um, thank you for this question. I think, um, whatever students do in the first few weeks of uh, learning uh, all the language requires more help and more guidance from from the instructor so that's why it's, it's really challenging to do it uh, via zoom at the same time you know breakout rooms in my case kind of mimics the uh, classroom format that uh, I, I teach um, in in a face to face when pretty much um a lot of tasks are done first, you know, as a group and then with a partner. So um, we, we may model, let's say we do like verb conjugation and we fill in the blanks uh, with verbs. So we would do this exercise as a group together and then people will do it uh, with a partner. It may seem unnecessary and repetitive. Why would people do the same exercise? But um, through, you know, first of all, people will have a chance to say themselves, you know, these words and correct the forms and then test the feed, test the hypothesis and kind of check the understanding on the, on the concept. So 
that could be something you could do in the classroom. So uh, don't send your students to do something new and something they haven't done, but something that we already kind of tested and 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 demonstrated as a, as a as a, in class with the teacher, uh, and they they will do it or finish this in uh in the breakout rooms. Also, I think setting clear instructions and clear goals uh for this uh for this type of work is really important so for breakout rooms they should really know what they're supposed to do um i think over instructing them is much better than under instructing providing very explicit ex instructions and expectations uh how many sentences they need to what what type of dialogue they need to producing how many sentences how many minutes they should be speaking russian only so that you know kind of a clear guidelines and expectations and uh parameters for the assignment i think is a key to make this uh work so i don't know when you say unsuccessful what why you think it was unsuccessful were they silent were they not clear what to do were they shy to speak um so there are a lot of things that can go wrong but also if you don't do it then there's no you're not develop they're not developing the kind of a the habit and the culture of working with the brain in, in breakout rooms so perhaps they need to be sort of a pe period when yeah things are uncomfortable things are a little kind of uh who says what but then they get in the habit uh of working with a partner in breakout rooms with little supervision and that uh, as the semester progresses they feel more and more kind of at ease doing this thank you, thank thank you. you. i agree it definitely is important to set those expectations and that can sometimes help things flow a little bit better thank you for that Evgeny. any of our other panelists have anything else to add about the breakout rooms maybe some things you've done to help students be more successful especially those in, you know, novice learners that are just brand new and maybe a little shy to speak? Um, sometimes for accountability on this, like on a novice level, um, I used um, a, a work a, a worksheet that will be like student one will have something written on it and blank spaces and student B will have other things written. So they have to communicate to fill this together. And so this is their product after their communication. Um, so there will be like, you know, the close exercise, very easy, for example, um, uh, the verb is missing and another person has all the verbs and another. So you ha they have to communicate to fill this out together. Uh, so this helps them to communicate. Um, another thing, maybe the same idea, but one of them have um, you know, a, a picture um, and needs to finish the picture. So again, something like uh, details are missing and they have to communicate to make this a whole picture. Um, yeah, so some ideas. So they kind of very shy to start talking, but they have to have something to hold on, some structure to to get it going. Adding the structure would definitely help, especially for those learners that are very reluctant to communicate. And, and again, setting those clear expectations and, and what our goals are for the students, I think, is a great way to help facilitate that. So, Natalia, I hope that if you do decide to try breakouts in the future, hopefully these tips will help. Um, definitely, I love the idea of getting in there and, and setting those expectations and also just not being afraid to just try to jump in and and even sort of like I go first and I might share something with the group and that even might get the conversation flowing a little bit. Uh, just take I, a look at the chat. Just, just yes. add, uh, sorry, sorry. You could also uh, uh, play with the number of people in the breakout rooms. Sometimes, you know, it, it two is great. Sometimes, you know, adding third person changes the dynamic. Sometimes it's four. So uh, it, it, could, it could also be a factor how many people are in the room and who you pairing who with whom uh so there's so many little psychological things that go into the uh that type of work so they you need to be you know thinking about and uh and and testing uh testing your diff you know your hypothesis and actually there's a really good question in the chat from victoria i think is a good piggyback talking about getting to know the students and her question is i was wondering how long you spend getting to know your students 
what they know in the beginning of class in order to drive your goals. Would love to have anyone, if anyone would like to chime in on that one. Great question, really good question. We actually try to get to know our students very well. It's through the uh, pre-course survey. So they uh, fill out the survey uh, in advance. We also ask them to go, we use like Discord um, channel uh, as like our social media semi-official correspondence. And that's why students also post four times a Per semester, they they participate in like a chat in, in interpersonal writing chats when they have to write instead of essay, they have to write about something and then other students have to comment. So, but in the beginning of the semester or earlier, they need to go there and they need to write about themselves. So, I actually mind about their hobbies, anything that they're sh comfortable to share about the dogs, their dogs like pets. Anything if they uh, travel uh, about experiences. So, and very often, all my courses or my activities I personalize and like customize. I can use it. It's like, okay, I already know that Tom likes hockey, Sarah likes, uh, I know, candy. So, and now, and I'm creating activity around this, right? Around what they actually shared with me in the beginning. And it will be, and it will be about uh, them uh, and like the, the specific students. And I noticed that it's, they 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 really like it, and especially if I also sometimes if I I ask them, okay, can can I take your pictures? And you I do like screenshot, and they take pictures, and then I create something with their faces, like let's say verb of motion activity, and there are faces of my students there. They really enjoy it because it's also personalized and things like this. So definitely a lot of a lot of the information, and I feel feel like that's when how you create the community. Because very often in other classes, uh, content classes, students do not have an opportunity to share about themselves. And in our smaller language classes, that's when they actually learn about what they like to eat, whether they have like dietary restrictions, what hobbies they like, what backgrounds, where they were born. Some of our students come in actually, they're or, um, adoptees, right, from uh, former Soviet Union. And that's, they share this experience with us, which I know for some, they would never share this experience on this part of their biography in other classrooms. So I think it does make our communities a little bit more like tiny, you know, like more personal and intimate, which helps to learn the language. I love that. And sometimes the online environment does allow us to get in and get to know our students on a deeper level, sometimes even in a face-to-face -face classroom. So we definitely need to make sure we're taking advantage of that. Thank you. Um, I, we are quickly winding down to the end. Um, we had one last question, maybe if somebody would like to chime in on this. This is from Natalia, and this is asking about fatigue students might feel whenever they're studying online, especially as the semester progresses. I think as online instructors, we can all relate to this. Does anyone have any tips or ideas as to how we might be able to address that? I mean, I think varying things as much as possible, uh, like what comes to mind is what Olga was talking about with having them do virtual museum visits and things, do the, do something different at some point so that it's not all, not all the same. That's the only thing that comes to my mind right away. Yes, and while it definitely is helpful, especially at the beginning, to establish a routine in the online environment, sometimes we, as creatures of habit, might get a little too comfortable, and we need to break out of that sometimes. And doing those fun activities and bringing the culture in, too, great way to loop everything in and combine it all together and do things that are fun that students will enjoy. And also, if you can bring that cultural component in as well, that's another win. Excellent. It definitely would keep the fatigue at bay, hopefully, for our students. So uh, we are just about out of time. Now we will have another session again. I realize everybody's joining us from different time zones. We have folks joining us from all over the world, which we greatly appreciate. But uh, 46 hours from now, we will start our second session. And once again, we do appreciate everyone's time. A huge thank you to all of our panelists. I knew this would go very quickly and it went by very, very quickly. Um, apologies if we didn't get to every question in the chat, but thank you all very much for joining us. We appreciate your time. We we will start up again in another 46 hours. Uh, also, I will once again put the link to our webinar series website into the chat if anyone has not bookmarked that yet. Also, please be sure to complete your survey for this panel to give us some valuable feedback to improve our sessions in the future. Thank you all very much, and we will hopefully see all of you in 46 hours. 
Take good care, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Sarah, for wonderful facilitation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, colleagues. So Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Jim. Mm -hmm.